Wow, that was quite the introduction. Thanks for coming today. Um, I do have some newsletters here, our latest one, that uh, the Bluebird Restoration Group puts out. And I also have some um, pamphlets here that have a lot of information about the Bluebirds, our organization, and starting trails and putting out boxes and things like that. So, um, Steve, are you going to dim the lights a little bit? Dim the lights? Those, those things glare in my glasses. So um, I don't know if it affects your screen, what you're looking at. but um, I always like to start with my photo of this bluebird. It's one of my first bluebird photos. And I'll tell you how I took this. I was at Lake Farms County Park about 20 years ago, and uh, digital photography was at the point where you had a little camera with two to three times zoom or something like that. And I had a bluebird pair that was nesting in a Peterson box down there. And I knew that the tree swallows were giving them heck trying to take over the box. So on my way home from work, I was on my motorcycle and I stopped by. And this male bluebird was fighting about six tree swallows that kept trying to go into the Peterson box and take over their nest. And um, so I was watching and he kept flying to this one tree, but I, I couldn't get this little digital camera to take much of a picture. And in my uh, uh, tank bag on my motorcycle, I had a little pair of uh, like opera glass type binoculars and I held it up to the tree and I zoomed in through the eyepiece. And that was my first digital bluebird photo that I took. So he's probably long gone, but. I, I still remember him. Um, so I do collect data every week on my bluebird trails. I got five bluebird trails in Dane County that I actually monitor. I have nine trails that I actually manage where I have friends that monitor them. Um, and then I report all my information to the Madison Audubon Society just to keep them informed on how things are going. And of course, the Bluebird Restoration Association of Wisconsin, which I used to be the president for, and now I'm still their, their editor for their newsletter for the last 20 years or so. And I could um, throw in this quote that Aldo Leopold said that a rare bird need remain no rarer than the people willing to venture their skill in building it a habitat. And with bluebirds, um, in the late 1800s, their numbers started to, to, to fall, mainly because house sparrows and starlings were taking over most of the natural cavity nesting that they were using. And um, so really by about uh, the 1940s, uh, bluebirds were really in a lot of trouble. Um, not only were those non-native species taking their uh, nesting spots, but uh, poles that they were nesting in used to be wooden poles that were rotting, and farmers used, started to replace the wooden poles with metal poles, um, and a lot of different things like that were causing a problem. So <clears throat> back in the 60s, a guy named Lawrence Zelaney out east decided that what we need to do is start putting out nest boxes for them, and then actually monitoring those boxes to keep the non-native species out of the nesting area. So um, that kind of kicked off what started as all these different bluebird organizations throughout different states. And uh, he had one clever idea that really got it started, is he got a hold of the media and he said, we're going to build a, a bluebird trail from the east coast to the west coast and help all the bluebirds across the United States. And you know, it was a dream which never did come true, but it was something that clicked so that all the morning news shows and everybody picked up on this, and it really got things going. In Wisconsin, it was the Department of Natural Resources that started the, the uh, Bluebird Restoration for the first two years. You could join and be a free member, and then after two years, you had to pay uh, something like $5 a year to be a member, and since then, it's gone up to 20 so looking at uh, our bluebirds, the male is on top of the box with the brighter colors. The female is hanging on the front of the box. And you can see her back is a little more gray blue rather than real bright blue. Um, I have seen some females that are so bright they look like males, um, especially in the front. Some of them have a lot of orange. Sometimes they're, they're just barely uh, tinted. Of course, they're, they're kind of more uh, muted on the back because when they're sitting on the nest on eggs or chicks, if anything looks in that box predator-wise, she blends right into that darkness down below on the nest. So they won't think that there's anything in there if they just take a quick peek. And then uh, the fledgling on the uh, right there, um, that's like one day out of the nest box. And they look very similar to a baby robin, except the coloring is all different. And that's because bluebirds are in the thrush family like robins are. But the only... Uh, thrush that nests in a cavity is the bluebird. All the other ones nest in a, a nest built similar to a robin. Looking at the habitat, 
This is one of the trails that I first took over back in the 90s at Uganda State Park. It's the overflow parking lot for the, the beach area. Um, when they built the Kiganda State Park, they must have thought everybody from Madison was going to use the beach because they built two huge parking lots down there. I seldom ever see this parking lot used for anything, um, but I did put out a nest box right to the right of that uh, maple tree there. And the first year that I had it there, I got three uh, different broods out of that box and fledged 15 bluebirds from one box. And uh, my first year, and I thought, boy, I really know what I'm doing. I really got this down. Um, unfortunately, the next year, I had two pair of bluebirds that were fighting for the same box. And what hens do is they take each other's eggs and throw them out, and they push them down into the bottom, and they build a nest over on each other's back. I got three out of the next year because it was July before a bluebird actually succeeded in that box. But looking at the habitat, it's short grass and it's pavement. And that's where insects crawl around and the bluebirds can sit in those trees or sit on any place up there and just look for those bugs, fly down and get them and fly right over to that maple tree and then go to the nest box to feed their young. So they don't use the picnic tables. Those are for the people. <laughs> so I got this shot south of Lake Farms County Park many years ago. Um, somebody had the good intentions of attracting bluebirds. Uh, they put this on a nest, on a pole. Um, Probably when the habitat was in better shape than this, but it's only about three feet off the ground and it's really, really low. Um, one of the things they thought back in the early days was that house sparrows don't like nesting low, but bluebirds will. The, the problem is that a box that low can easily be predated by cats and raccoons and snakes and stuff. So um, not a good idea to have one that low. The other thing is it looks like it's a really deep box with a four, two by four on the end of it. Um, I believe that was a Hill Lake box that was real popular for a while in the 90s. And the idea with that was the, the box would be deep enough that uh, the bluebird could nest down toward the bottom and a raccoon or something couldn't reach in and down. But after a bluebird nested in that once, I discovered she didn't want to go all the way down in. She built her nest all the way up to the entrance hole. And that meant the eggs and the chicks were right there, easy grabbing. So what we've decided that we like is the NAB style box or North American Bluebird Society box. This is the one that we promote the most. Uh, this, these are made by Fred Craig and um, Lacrosse, and he's an excellent craftsman, does a really good job. Uh, it's got the right drop. It's got a nice overhang made out of nice thick uh, wood so that it stays warm. Uh, it can be vented. We've got a different method of venting the box where you can drop this down and um, have a vent hole in the spring when it's colder in April and May. And it has a nice side that lifts up so you can look inside. And when you find a bluebird in there, all the better. Not only that, they're 15% off right now. All right, so I mentioned monitoring. And that's something that we, uh, we like people to do once a week. And basically, all you do is go look inside the box. And a lot of people take a pad of paper or something and just write down their number of the box. Uh, whether they find nesting material in there, uh, if they can tell what type of nest it is. Is it a chickadee? Is it a um, bluebird? Or is it a tree swallow? Or something like that. Um, then you close it up, and that's all you need to do. Nowadays, I take my cell phone, take a picture of the box, look inside, take a picture, and then I can just keep moving, and I take my data home with me on the phone. I can add it to paper and, and afterwards. And then at the end of the year, I take all my boxes that I've got, and I just do a quick form like this for bra. And just simple stuff like how many boxes you have, how many were used by bluebirds, what other species used them. Uh, we want to know what county you're in just so we can kind of tell what's going on throughout the state. And just a few things right there. Uh, most of the time in our comments, it's either weather related because it's either too cold, too wet, too crappy in the spring, um, too hot in the summer, um, or they have house grow problems. And another thing is you can go online and do it real easy. Uh, basically, you fill out a quick form and you can just hit send and it'll email it to our data guy. And that's how we collect all the information. So, uh, another quick story on one of my um, trails at Kiganda State Park was I went there one morning on a Sunday and I noticed that there were tree swallows sitting above the nest box. And tree swallows will often wait until bluebird chicks are fledged from a box and then they'll quick swoop in 
and they'll build their or lay their eggs and put some feathers in that nest. And they cheat by using the bluebird's nest that's there already. They don't have to put in all the grass and everything. But I, when I noticed when I went there to look in the box, there was one tree swallow egg in the left side, one dead tree swallow, a bluebird in the middle, and one bluebird chick that was still alive. And there were three bluebird chicks missing from when I uh, checked it on uh, previous checks. So I figured three of them were probably at the point where they could jump out of the box and fled. And the tree swallows killed one and laid an egg. So I had this chick there that I figured wasn't going to be making it with those tree swallows around. So I decided I had another box that had a chicks about the same age, had four chicks about a half mile back in the um, park. And it's on my motorcycle. So I took the chick out and put her in my tank bag in a little grass. And I'm going to ride her over to this other nest box. And when I went out to check that box to make sure that uh, there were still chicks in it, she climbed out or it climbed out of the um, tank bag and was sitting there waiting for me when I got back to my motorcycle. So I did put it in the box. And I did go back. And all five of those chicks had fudged because adult bluebirds can't count. They feed whoever's there. And they're all gone. And that's my biker chick story for you. <laughs> all right. So let's go to Bluebird Basics quick. The female selects the box. She builds the nest. The male, of course, will defend the territory. Um, and she does most of the work while the uh, egg laying and incubating and raising the chicks go. And as soon as uh, the chicks fledge the box, so that's when the male takes over. He helps them uh, feed and learn how to be a bluebird. And that's when he takes over his parental responsibilities. He doesn't do any nest building because she won't let him in the box. So when I go to monitor, I might look in there and see a hen sitting on the nest like this. And you can see that the nest is a nice um, bunch of nice grasses and straw, stuff like that. Nothing real rough, it's just uh, grasses. And then she's sitting on eggs. So I just take a picture and I'll get the egg count the next time that I go to monitor. I'll just mark it in my thing that's the bluebird nest. And sometimes you look inside and the nest is made with some pine needles. Some bluebirds prefer to use needles for some reason. Uh, some people think that's a natural insect uh, preventive type thing, but could just be the materials available. You can see there's robin blue eggs in the one nest. That's because of like a thrush, they're robin blue eggs, but they're a little smaller than our robin would lay. And then in the lower right corner, <clears throat> there's uh, white eggs. I saw that and I kind of thought they looked like tree swallow eggs to me. But tree swallows always line their nests with chicken and duck feathers. They just always do that right before they lay the eggs. Very unusual to find tree swallow eggs with all feathers around it. That's because 5% of bluebird hens lay white eggs. They don't have the ability to color that egg blue right before they lay the egg. And any uh, hen that has female offspring, those females carry that same trait. So for a while at Kiganza, I had two different white laying hens, egg laying hens, that were around for about four years. And then they disappeared. I don't know what happened to them, but bluebirds only live about four to five years, so they might have moved on or they might have died off. But it's kind of cool to get them. You kind of tell when they move from one box to the other because they're the only ones that are laying white eggs. So um, when you go to check after a couple of weeks of incubation, you'll find the chicks. This is hatch day practically, I guess. And that chick, I opened the box and thought I was going to give it a nice worm or a bug or something to eat. And then uh, after they're in the box, about 15 to maybe 17, 18 days, somewhere in there, they turn into little bluebirds with all their feathers, and they're just about ready to fledge, be close to it. What will happen is the female and the male will sit outside the box and start to sing and chirp and not feed them anymore. And they get real inquisitive and want to get out of the box anyway. And that's what gets them to jump. So I mentioned that we collect all our data. This is a chart that just shows uh, since 1998 um, how our bluebirds have been doing. Now, this is our membership data. So it doesn't mean that there's only 13,683 that are in the state total. That's just from our membership report. Um, you can kind of see that things go uh, up and down throughout the seasons. And one of the main reasons for those drops can be winter weather. Um, a lot of our bluebirds go down south for the winter. About 10% do stay in the state of Wisconsin. But those ones that go down south, if you recall, uh, some of the uh, harsh weather that hits down in Texas, Oklahoma, 
uh, across the Gulf states sometimes where they get some winter weather down there and it uh, destroys their um, energy, um, you know, uh, power plants and stuff. They can't get the heat going. Um, then we get reports from people down south that have found dead bluebirds. Uh, they're either not getting food or it's too cold for them. Um, bluebirds, that, when they want to stay uh, warm at night, will gather in one nest box. There'll be <clears throat> five or six of them to keep warm. And people were opening boxes and finding them all dead in there. Um, that was a couple of years ago when, when Texas had that really bad uh, uh, snowstorm and, and uh, power outage. And so Oklahoma was hit bad then too. Um, that year was one of the worst years we had in Wisconsin as far as the numbers returning to the state. And that's where you see that really, uh, that big drop off right there. Um, I always like to point out when I do this though, that um, right about here in 2000 is when I got in, active in the organization and you can see the blue line quickly went up, but um, it was just a coincidence. <laughs> All right, so I mentioned that uh, Uber, uh, don't always make it. This happens to be a female that was trying to nest in the state park and a house barrel came along and killed her. Um, and actually because they migrate, that uh, there's fatalities and uh, fatalities and, and boober migration, of course, too. Any birds that migrate do run into problems on uh, whether they're getting hit by windows or caught by cats or raccoons or whatever. So we do lose about 55% of our bluebirds that do fledge. So um, that's kind of a disappointing thing, but that's why we have to be diligent about keeping putting out boxes and, and getting our numbers up. The competitors are tree swallows. That's a native bird. Uh, if you're near any lakes or water, you can expect tree swallows. They're a really nice uh, bird to have as well. Um, and doesn't hurt to increase their numbers as well. They are very aggressive after they lay eggs in the nest. When you go to check the box, you can bet they'll be zipping right by your head and they'll be clicking away, trying to drive you away. Um, starlings, we pretty much got rid of by using a, a small enough hole that they can't fit inside. So they're, they're more of a problem with um, old woodpecker holes. They take over and they might kill, they might knock out, out eggs in a, in a natural cavity. The chickadee down below, they'll use a bluebird box. Unfortunately, because the hole is so big, um, they, might, they might get a nest with eggs in it, and then a tree swallow or a bluebird might come along and get in that hole and decide to nest over the chickadee nest. So they do have failures that way. But whenever I see the little grass, uh, green material that a chickadee is starting to build a nest in the box, I put a little one and an eighth inch reducer hole over the front of the box. That way the chickadee can get in, but the bigger birds can't. And it gives the chickadees their chance to get their nesting. They'll have about seven or eight eggs in there. And uh, when you open it up, you see these little black capped chickadees in there, really fun. And then once they fledge, which is around Memorial Day, then I remove the reducer hole because chickadees only nest once per season. And then I usually get bluebirds or tree swallows in the nest box after chickadees are done. So that, it's a win-win for me. Um, house wrens, you know, they're great in the backyard. They sing a lot. They, they pick off bugs from the garden. But on bluebird trails, they're really stinkers. They like to break the eggs and, and put sticks in the box and stuff. Um, so I don't mind them in my backyard, but I really don't like them on my bluebird trail. So I try to put my boxes away from trees and shrubs that the wrens really like. And I try to put them in open spaces that wrens will avoid. So pretty much works, but sometimes those wrens will outsmart me and take the box anyway. And then the house sparrows in the upper right-hand corner, they're a non-native species. so. Um, they are they are tough to get rid of or tough to deal with when you have them in a nest box or trying to take over a bluebird box. Like I say, they're not they're not native. They're brought over here uh, for two reasons. One was to help control agricultural pests on farming back in the 1800s, and they do eat a few insects, but they're basically seed eaters. So that really didn't work too much as far as um, helping farmers go. Uh, but a lot of people out east that were um, from Europe, they really like the house sparrow as a chirpy native bird in the city. They like their singing and everything. Um, so that was another reason they brought them over. The problem is that they just kind of took over the whole United States and took over all the nest boxes that people had out or any, any cavity. So um, started to hurt our bluebird population quite a bit. They're not protected by law because they're not native. Um, very difficult to get rid of. But first, when I started doing trails, I would try to remove the nest all the time. It takes five or six weeks before a house bird will give up on a nest box. And by that time, you've already lost the first part of the nesting season. 
So they do have um, the banner trap that you can use that in this box here. You set it. When a sparrow goes in there, it clicks or close. You put a bag over this, open this up, the sparrow flies to the top, and then you can get rid of the sparrow. Um, it just isn't a fun thing to do. You know, you're in this to have a good time when you're um, encouraging bluebirds and trapping birds and getting rid of them isn't really a fun thing. So if I really have a house sparrow problem, I just close the box up or pull it and then move it to a different spot. I, I just don't really enjoy trapping sparrows. I did find after you trap four or five that the sparrows leave the box alone, but um, it still takes a long time to do that. And I would just rather move the box to a place where I can get bluebirds. So that's, uh, that's what I try to do. Um, they do adapt to almost any habitat, and they do destroy bluebird eggs and kill adults, as I showed you in one photo. And so I always tell people, if you have house sparrows around and you um, have bluebird boxes, just don't feed them, because if you're feeding them and then you put out a box, you're really making it just perfect habitat for um, house sparrows. So what I found out is that if you take a little piece of fishing line, you can see I don't use much, and you put that on your bird feeders, house sparrows will not come and feed at that bird feeder. They will feed on the ground, but they don't like fishing line for some reason. And don't ask me the scientific reason because I don't know. Native birds don't care. I get all the house finches, morning doves, everything to go into the tray feeder and eat the safflower. I get, if I didn't have that fishing line on that um, peanut feeder, I'd have six house sparrows in there just eating those peanuts in like half an hour. But a little bit of fishing line, and I get chickadees and nut hatches and, um, Woodpeckers go into that, and they never have to deal with house sparrows. I have a neighbor behind me that feeds some really cheap bird seed with a lot of millet and cracked corn, and he has about 50 house sparrows that love it over in his backyard. They come over and use my bird bath. They come over and sometimes use the ground, but I never have them on my bird feeders because I use that little bit of fishing line trick. I learned about it from a Pennsylvania newsletter that I got many years ago. Um, they told me if you put it on the front of a bluebird box, House sparrows won't use the bluebird box. They don't like the fishing line on it. We did experiments with it with, in the bluebird organization and found it just didn't work. The, the sparrows are just going to push right past it. Or your fishing line is going to blow up and hang on the top of the roof and all kinds of stuff. I even put fishing line on top of it where the male likes to sit and sing, and it still didn't stop them. But as far as feeding goes, for some reason, I just had a, I had a feeder that the sparrows are, were just killing in my backyard. And I decided, well, I'm just going to put some fishing line on just a little bit. You don't want a lot that they're going to get tangled up in or other birds are going to get tangled in. You just want a little bit. I put it on there, and just like that, the house sparrows left. And I've been doing it for probably 15 years now, and I don't have any starving house sparrows, so I'm, I'm happy with it. I did mention predators. We do have problems with predators, uh, mostly raccoon. Uh, we don't have too much of a problem with snakes here in Wisconsin. Down south they do, but here we don't really. Um, but you can put a baffle on, like up on the left corner there. That keeps the raccoon from climbing up. Uh, we have these knoll guard type things, these cages. And basically you put that on the front of the box, like so. And a raccoon can't get up there. It, it gets poked by it. Um, can't get through that wiring. And... Uh, the upper one was a guy, one of our board members, uh, Dave Lucy in Cross Plains. He was finding that the lower one had just enough room for a raccoon to squeeze in there and reach in and get the eggs out of his nest boxes. So he made the thing even smaller, even longer, and tried to keep the raccoons from getting in there. But then he found the bluebird hens didn't like that wide of a cage to go in. So he added that little strip of wood, and then the bluebirds would go right in there. So he's found that, that new kind of modified knoll guard um, to be more successful than the lower ones. And the reason it's called a knoll guard is because the guy down in southern Illinois, with his last name being Noel, invented it to keep cats out of his bluebird boxes. So it just is called the knoll guard because it's got his name on it. So, And I do find bluebirds don't care. They land right on the front of it. I leave mine on year round if I have a trail with raccoon problem. And I do find sometimes that the hen will put grass in that lower part of the knoll guard to pad it so that she doesn't have to walk on the wire. But only a couple times. I don't have that a lot. That's a male that's in there right now going in to help feed. So another thing you can do to attract bluebirds, especially when the young ones come out of the box, is put out some mealworms. 
Bluebirds love mealworms. And uh, you can see in the lower right corner that the parents were real smart and showed them right where the food was so they can just feed themselves there. And then they're in the thrush family. So the one in the lower left shows bluebird chicks that just came out of the box that are bathing. You see robins bathing all the time, bluebirds or thrushes, they bathe just as much. They just love to play in the water. When I go around the state, I do find some things that kind of make my, scratch my head because an upside down box might get used by a bird, but it's not a very good idea to have the hole toward the bottom. Uh, top center, we've got a bluebird box that tipped over, opened up, and it got a thrush, but it got the wrong thrush. It got the robin in there and not the bluebird. Um, then we've got a couple that are kind of upside down and falling apart. Obviously, somebody's not uh, watching the trail too well if that's happening. We've got a leaner there, so the, the birds have to go in sideways. Uh, then we've got the lower right one is a PVC box, which was another box that was uh, designed to keep house sparrows out, but it doesn't work 100%. But you can see it's kind of full of a mouse nest or something. Um, so what happens is, Overall, any of these boxes, um, somebody had a good idea to put out boxes for birds and then quit, gave up. If you're not going to have the birds come into the box, you might as well take it down because this is what will happen if it's not uh, monitored properly. It's going to fall apart, end up housing mouse, mice or something like that. So not a good thing to do. So we do uh, appreciate members and you can support us by membership or donations. And that's the end of my story. Yep, yeah. Okay. Okay. This is the fun part about having a bluebird talk. Almost every time I have questions and answered afterwards, people want to know about the fishing line with the bird feeders. Uh, yeah, they, house sparrows do eat a lot of expensive bird seeds. So it is a really good question, even if you aren't trying to um, attract bluebirds. Uh, for a, a tube feeder, all you really do need to do is, is tie a little piece onto either the, the handle here and let it hang down about five or six inches, or you can tie it to it or tie it onto a perch, tape it on, whatever you can do. It doesn't take much. Start minimum and just see. But um, when I put out that peanut feeder two winters ago and I looked out and saw these house sparrows are just surrounding it and feeding on it, I just got my fishing line and went out there and tied it on there put some more peanuts in it and walk back. And they looked and they just took off, they were gone. Um, they really like some certain types of food. So just one fish, one piece of line, just like those photos showed. And, and, and don't, you know, somebody uh, in Milwaukee one time showed me what she did and she took a whole spool and just wrapped it all around the, <laughs> well, uh, not a good idea because you don't want birds tangled in it. Then you have to go out there and free morning doves or something like that. Um, the other thing is Nebraska came out with what they called a sparrow halo about 15 years ago as well. And that was uh, something that you put above your bird feeder and it had fishing line that hung all the way around it. And you put little weights on the end of the lines or had little weights in the line. I think they sold it for 15 or $20 or something like that. Um, but I did see people uh, posting photos on Facebook of morning doves caught in the, the line because of that anchor and stuff. And, and I thought, you know, it looks probably nicer as far as something you can sell, but it really isn't necessary to have it. You don't have to spend money like that. You can just take a little fishing line and tape it or tie it on. Um, and, uh, you know, it just doesn't take any type of fishing line as long as it's the plastic type, not the um, nylon. Um, that, that seems to work best. And uh, I've done it on seed feeders. I've done it on suet feeders. I've done it on peanut feeders. And it just takes a little bit, doesn't take a lot. You can take it. And I do find that maybe after one year, year and a half, that fishing line does kind of lose its power. <laughs> so I t remove it and put fresh on. And that seems to work um, really good at stopping them again. So, yeah. Well, uh, you know, it, it might take a little bit of luck, but um, we have found now that more people are reporting that their bluebirds are coming back. This past year, people that had that same problem said, oh, they, they've got them back again. It just may take some time before those bluebirds find that habitat suitable. It takes a male to discover it and start singing, female to take it. 
So um, you know, if if it works the way it is uh, and they're using it, that's fine. Um, I just found that the the female bluebirds were building their nest really high up, and I know there's uh, some guys up in Green Bay that still prefer the taller box, and they tell me what they do is they wait till she lays eggs and then they remove a whole bunch of that and drop the nest down again, and that makes her drop down in again. So um, I just don't suggest doing that. And I also found that deeper boxes get the tree swells love them. Tree swells love being down in that darker bottom box. Um, so I just, I just kind of like that nav style uh, box. This seems to have everything that bluebirds like. Lawrence Laney kind of tested a whole bunch of them when he started doing bluebird research, and that's basically what he came up with for the North American Bluebird Society was the nav, nav box. So that's what navs means, the North American Bluebird Society. That's how it gets that name. But keep your fingers crossed, and hopefully they'll, they'll come back maybe this year. How about back there? Yeah, I've, I've had that happen a couple of times. Um, it was at Uganda State Park when I was checking boxes, and all of a sudden I realized that one of the birds going in there with food was a fledgling from the first uh, brood. And, yeah, they take over and help feed just like um, the adults are doing. But it's not real common. It's not really. Um, I did have one box there where the fledglings were in a Peterson box, and it took them 25 days before they would jump out of the box, which is the longest I ever had bluebird chicks in a box. And then when the bluebirds came back and nested again, those five chicks hung around that box. It's like they did not want to leave. They were That was a real tight-knit family for some reason. Yeah, right here. Okay, the notch is just these guys in, in the cross. Um, to, to distinguish it from the North American Bluebird Society, they like to do this little bit of a notch, kind of like a signature, so they can call it the NAB style box, and it's their own nest box that they make. They also make this so that the side can be, there's these lines drawn here, that in around Memorial Day, you can take the two screws out, drop this down a half an inch, which is indicated there, it's got two holes so that you can vent the box, and you know, it's got a golf tee inside here. The golf tee goes in the back to keep this from opening up then. And that's just uh, some of the tricks that they do, kind of overthinking, I guess, a little bit. But um, those are what, that's the purpose of the notch. And uh, as far as cleaning goes, I like to get there after the bluebirds fledge and remove that first nest if I can and just clean out the box real quickly. And that spurs the, the, the hen to go back in and build a nest and lay eggs a little bit quicker. Um, I was talking about the tree swallows waiting to use the box. And at Kiganza uh, State Park, I noticed that was really kind of a common thing. So I started what I called the bluebird advantage. When I saw that happening, what I would do when the bluebirds fledged, I'd try to get there right away and leave the box open like this, prop it open for one week. Because with the box open, those tree swallows would have to find someplace else to go nest. And then after about a week, close it up. And that bluebird pair that succeeded once wants to use that box again. But if the tree swallows are in there, of course, they have to go someplace else. And at Kiganza State Park, I found that when they go someplace else, it's one of the houses outside the park where I can't collect the data. So by keeping the tree swallows out just for that week or so, I would get the second brood our second brood in the same box and get bluebirds again and increase my data not harm the tree swallows at all but um, increase my numbers of bluebirds that way and be able to see what's going on better yeah over there and the yeah we usually say about um March 15th or so is a good time to have the boxes ready to go. We've got some bluebirds are kind of really coming back and starting to claim their boxes. They really don't start nesting until April, though, uh, down in the southern part of the state. Um, up north, it might be more um, later April or, or early May. They usually have two broods. Sometimes they have three. I don't know if three broods is the same pair going three times one box or if it's two that succeeded and then another pair comes along. Without banding and all that kind of stuff, I can't control um, who's using the box. But 
Uh, triple broods were that one year um, that was the highest point in there. We uh, had over 32,000 bluebirds fledged. That was a phenomenal year. I think it was 2012. Um, might have been a little bit of an early spring, but I don't remember it being very early. wasn't wasn't nine degrees like it was this morning anyway. But uh, bluebirds were nesting the end of March that year. Uh, I had three pair that already were sitting on eggs on March 28th, and it was uh, it was like across the state uh, bluebirds nested early. And that year, everybody had three broods practically too. So the numbers really shot up for that one particular year. Um, but then since then, we've had some really cold, wet springs, and you know things haven't been good. And then the other thing about cleaning boxes at the end of the season, after um, Labor Day, it's pretty much you can clean the boxes out. No birds are going to be using nesting boxes anymore after that. Most birds are fledged by Labor Day. I have had, I think, once a bluebird pair that went to mid-September, but most, most birds are done by Labor Day. I didn't clean the box out. And then I usually check my boxes in winter to keep the mice out because sometimes mice will get in there. Mice will follow a box, um, poop and pee all over the inside and just... Um, not a good bluebird box that the mice get in there. So I try to keep them out. I don't like the, they're cute little mice. I don't ever take my wife with me because she'd probably bonk me over the head if she saw me moving the nest out of there. But um, I don't, don't let mice in the box. So right now is a good time to be putting them out, cleaning out boxes that are already there. Um, I did see bluebirds already. The first ones I saw were in January by Indian Lake. There were nine of them that were on a power line. So they do have winter over. Unfortunately, they're wintering over on buckthorn. That's not a good berry for, for most birds. Um, but they do eat poison ivy berries and lots of other stuff. So um, they do survive winter if they are around. They're tough birds. Yeah. No, it's just that, uh, yeah, it's, it's just some, some kind of a, yeah, genetic defect that they can't color it blue. <laughs> Um, and it passes along. So, yeah, back there. Yeah, you know, uh, some people will tell you that the oval hole is, is better because uh, when they feed them, it, it just gives the bird a chance to land at the hole and reach inside and feed the chicks faster and then leave. Well, I don't know. Um, I think they can reach into an, a round hole just as well. It's more of a design thing, I think. Vince uh, Peterson, I think, was the first guy who came out with a triangle-shaped box that actually faces downward. Uh, he kind of thought that woodpeckers always build their nest on branches that look downward, so that bluebirds probably like that too. I see a lot of woodpeckers that nest on poles that are, or branches that are straight up and stuff. But the oval hole is basically a design thing that came out of the Peterson box. These guys use it just because it's harder to make so they can do it, and oh, everybody's impressed by that nice oval they make. I've never had a bluebird leave me a note that said, we prefer the round hole. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I usually build mine with a round just because it's easier to, to do a one, uh, one and a half inch drill with a coarser bit than it is to do it. I can do these, but they're kind of a pain to do it. But Okay, one more here. Oh yeah, well, um, because you want to look inside, for me, you know, this is perfect height, about six feet or just under, um, or five feet is good. That's, that's probably the best because most people can look inside. If some people are a little bit shorter, they might be able to use a mirror to look in and look up at a mirror. Or what I do is I, if, I, if I had to, I take a cell phone and just stick it in there and take a picture of it, and I can see that way. They will nest 20 feet high, but good luck getting up there to monitor that once a week. When you put them out on a pole, that's the best height. And if you put them on a tree, the bluebirds might use them, but also that just uh, it's a little bit easy for raccoons and, and cats to climb up there and, and get inside. So don't really recommend the, the tree thing if you can avoid that. Yeah. Um, well, they'll eat both. Generally in the summertime, uh, live ones are the best. And they, they can damage the back pocketbook a little bit because they aren't exactly cheap to feed a lot of them. What I recommend what people do is bluebirds will learn real quickly that you're going to put mealworms out for them. So when you put them in the dish, you can tap on the dish. They usually learn the squeaky noise of the patio door or the door opening and closing. They will come in and feed or they'll take the mealworms to the nest box and feed the young. Do it twice a day and just enjoy it. Have a cup of coffee or whatever and just watch them do it. And um, then when it gets colder, 
or even if it's summer and you want to do it cheaper with freeze dried, go about 50 50 live and freeze dried to get them acclimated to the freeze dried worms. And then they will accept the freeze dried better if um, they, they slowly get it, uh, eating them with the live ones. And in winter, of course, it's hard to put out live ones. So in the fall, try to do the 50 50 thing and just wean them off the live ones onto the freeze dried. And I put out freeze dried right now underneath my bird feeders. I have so many birds that eat those freeze dried mealworms. The, the robins come in the evening, they'll clean up whatever's left there. I've got sparrows, uh, uh, native sparrows, the uh, uh, um, white crowned, white throated. Um, this year I had a field sparrow that wintered over my backyard. I live right over by West Town, so it's kind of weird to have a field sparrow all winter. Um, I've got three tree sparrows, American tree sparrows that are, they come down. A lot of birds will feed on those mealworms, especially this time of year when there's a little snow cover and then they can't find seed. Um, but I use the freeze dry ones for that. Okay, that's it. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. And don't forget there's deer falcons. Come and get a free newsletter if you like. We do this quarterly. And I got these brochures here. And I'll stick, I'll stick around if anybody has any one-on-one -on -one questions they want to ask.